first reading for Reformation Day comes from Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly over heaven, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all who sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because of His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the Holy Gospel.
You may be seated. Thank you. 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Five hundred and five years ago tomorrow marks the day when Martin Luther famously posted his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. It was, at the time, not a particularly noteworthy event. Luther, a monk and professor at the local university, wasn't setting out to change the course of history. He had no idea that his actions would cause such a momentous split in the Christian church, and in a very real sense, change the face of European political and religious history. The Reformation has had wide-ranging results, both good and bad. On the bad side, we can trace things like the horrific Thirty Years' War, bloody conflict that raged across Europe, killing its millions. All of it traced back to the root of the conflict with Catholics and Lutherans over these religious disputes. Furthermore, the incredible fracturing of the Christian Church, now with a myriad of denominations, many of whom sadly stand firm on positions contrary to Scripture, shows another unintended consequence of the Reformation. Much good has also come from such a simple act 505 years ago. All Luther wanted to do was to start a conversation, a conversation about what he had discovered, or we might say rediscovered, simply by actually reading the Bible. Luther rediscovered was this, the pure sweetness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It seemed somewhat ridiculous that the gospel would need to be rediscovered in the Christian church. That was precisely what was needed. The Roman church had sadly over time been obscuring the sweetness of Jesus and his mercy and grace for us. They had heaped countless man-made requirements upon the faith terrifying poor, simple peasants, keeping the truths of the gospel hidden away. Prior to 500 years ago, when Luther published his German translation of the New Testament in 1522, the Bible was inaccessible to all but elite learned people of the day. God's people, by and large, came to church each week just to go through the motions, following the patterns they had always done, without really ever knowing why. They were passive viewers in the Sunday morning service, told what little they needed to know by the priest, but kept in the dark about Christ's mercy and forgiveness. They were told only to fear God and his wrath, the harsh sting of the law being used to keep society in line, heavy yoke and burden of obligations that must be strictly observed. People, being taught that their works were necessary to gain salvation and that their obedience was the key to gaining entrance into heaven. In many ways, it was no different than the circumstances surrounding God's people while Christ actually walked the earth. The Pharisees and other religious leaders in Israel had a firm grasp on the interpretation of Scripture, leading to what we might call a fence around the law. If you keep these commandments that we've created, then you'll definitely keep the Ten Commandments and be good with God. But in doing so, they too were placing an undue burden upon God's people. They were creating extra laws that God had not commanded, in effect, putting themselves in the place of God, telling the people how they should live and behave. Their man-made decrees were keeping them from seeing who Christ is and what he was there to do. Jesus says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and never have been enslaved to anyone. What is it that you say you will become free? Sin and slaves. It tends to be a snowball effect. Where one sin leads to another, and another, and another. And soon you're stuck, whether it be in a big lie, 
bottom of a bottle, or some other rock bottom place. Sin begets sin. Worst of all, Satan knows this. He will remind you constantly of your sin, throwing the burden of guilt and chains of remorse upon you, heaping larger and larger amounts of lies to tell you that there is no hope, there is no relief. You've gone too far this time, you've done too much, you could never be forgiven. He tricks us into thinking that following all those other rules in an attempt to clear our own consciences, to go above and beyond in order to make things right, is how we can find freedom. All of this just obscures Christ, stopping our ears from hearing the sweetness of what he's telling us today. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus says elsewhere in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth, the life. Christ has set you free, and you are free forever. This is what Luther rediscovered when he was so eager to share and discuss on that October day 505 years ago. He had discovered for himself that he was free in Christ. The system set up by the Roman Catholic Church of paying for indulgences and doing good works to earn salvation it was all a ruse, a lie of Satan to keep Christians in chains. Chronic guilt he felt over his sin, with no possible hope for forgiveness, was gone because of Christ. He had discovered and we continue to unpack in the coming years the important distinction between law and gospel for the Christian. On its own, the proclamation of the law is death. We can never hope to stand before the holy and just law of God. We see God's law and we see afresh the ways that we have, as St. Paul says, fallen short of the glory of God. There's no hope in the law. There is no salvation for us in the law. For if we try to remain under the law, then we're forced to live under it completely and perfectly. We would be completely accountable to God for our actions, deserving nothing but death and condemnation for our grievous failure. Now, the righteousness of God appears apart from perfect obedience to the law, we could never do such a thing. The righteousness and holiness of God comes to us through faith in Christ. As believers, we are justified by God's grace as a gift, a gift so that we might never boast of it being our own work. The gospel tells us that nothing can separate us from God's love. The gospel tells us that we have been made right with God because of the blood of Christ shed for us on Calvary. The gospel tells us that we have been set free in Christ. Luther loved to cling to this reality. It completely revolutionized his life, and all his efforts after this point were spent proclaiming and defending this great truth of the Scriptures. So all our lives cling to this truth. Our faith rests on its secure foundation. You are justified, made right with God because of God's work. You are justified apart from your own works of the law. You have been set free by the Son. Sin no longer binds you. Satan has no power over you. As we rejoice in the discovery of this comforting truth by Luther, let us never lose sight of his goals. He didn't want to start a new church, nor did he want to leave and break from Rome. His goal was always a reformation, a fixing of the problems that have arisen. And so while we celebrate the faith we have in Christ, we also grieve the separation and wounds that have torn asunder Christ's church. Just like Luther, we cannot allow this truth to be hindered. And we cannot lose the great treasures entrusted to us by our Lutheran forefathers. 
we go out into the world, into our daily lives, free in Christ, let us always proclaim the word and deed, that freedom that we have in Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding in your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We stand as we sing the offering. <laughs> Jesse, 
and Roberta, and comfort them with the promise that you are with them always. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Father, you have granted us the privilege of a place at Christ's table. Give us faithful and repentant hearts by your Spirit, that we who receive worthily your Son's body and blood, and depart to bear his fruit in lives of holiness and humble service. Bless your church through the forgiveness of sins, that we would have a clear conscience before you, and live in peace with one another. Lord, in your mercy. In your Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us by your word and out of the darkness of the earth into the light of your grace. Mercifully help us to walk in that light. Guard us from error and false doctrine, and grant that we would not become ungrateful and despise your word, but receive it with all our heart, conduct our lives according to it, and put our trust in your grace. In the merits of Jesus Christ, our Son, and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> He 
thanks to the Lord for he is good. <laughs>